All right, everything seems to be going well. I think we should be uh, we should be up and live here. Good to go. Awesome. Yeah, we're good to go. Um, so, thanks everybody for for checking us out again tonight. Um, you know, we've been on a bit of a roll now with these these Tuesday nights, and it's it's been really fun. Um, you know, talking about the Canadian game, but specifically kind of going back and and talking a little bit more about you know, the, the basics of Canadian football. And I think it's something that, you know, a lot of players were, were really excited when, you know, we came out and said, hey, like, this is what we're going to do. Um, and I think it's just a great opportunity for, for other coaches to come on here and kind of, you know, connect the dots. I think a lot of us, we were kind of talking before, I think a lot of people, you know, when they're learning the game, they learn it from like their position and they might learn it from, you know, a specific coach who uses a specific set of terminology. And then we were kind of talking, whenever you make that jump, you know, you go from, like Bantam house league football to high school or high school football to, to youth sport of the NCAA or then that pro jump, you know, you yeah. really realize like how big the world of football is. And I think if you start on a solid foundation, you have a lot, uh, you know, that you can build on it and learn um, from that foundation. But I know just in, in my own transition to youth sport and, and other guys I've coached, there is a challenge there in terms of your first couple of years, like how quickly you can get on the field is often you know, super tied into, uh, you know, how much you know, how you can learn the playbook. And I think if you start learning the playbook um, from from the context of I've never seen any of this before or, you know, I, I don't have anything other than my basic high school understanding of the game. You know, if you play at a high school that maybe runs a lot of different stuff, maybe you have that breadth of knowledge. But, you know, I think this is a great, you know, thing that we're trying to do to help, whether it's athletes or even young coaches. Like I've had a lot of young coaches reach out to me and say, hey, you know, my son's an offensive lineman and I played, you know, defensive back, but now I'm coaching the O-line for a Bantam team or, or whatever it is, um, you know, so just okay, excited keep, yeah, excited to keep building that today and, you know, joined by uh, Argo's defensive lineman, Robbie Smith, the guy that I got to know uh, during his time at Laurier. Uh, and, and, you know, thanks, Robbie, for, for making the time to talk to us about, you know, the, the fundamental defensive fronts that make up, you know, the defenses in Canadian football. Yeah, no, uh, I'm really excited to, to get this started. Um, I enjoy a lot of the content and all the time when I'm at the field with guys. I'm like, I tell them like, hey, you got to watch these three down development videos. They like they have a whole bunch of information. Like, they spread a whole bunch of knowledge. So I'm really excited to start it. Hey, I appreciate it, man. And, you know, like like I was kind of saying to you before, it, it, it's it's amazing how much great coaching there is in the three down game. I think a lot of people and even I've been guilty of it, like in doing this channel, have you know oh like what's Alabama doing or like when the you know the Patriots had Cam Newton going like what are they doing with the quarterback run game and it's been amazing to kind of take a huge break from any of the stuff going on down south and really dive into hey like let's watch you know eight games of this team's defense or eight games of this team's offense and you know the level of coaching in Canadian football has never been higher and, and one of the things I'm worried about with the absence is people will assume that that's because the product wasn't where it needed to be and it's got mm -hmm. nothing to do with the product and I think people that you know, know the CFL game, you know, there are some coaches in the CFL that are operating in our game at just a higher level as the NFL guys. It's just a different game. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Awesome. Well, you can get rolling here. If anyone's watching this who hasn't, you know, subscribed to us yet, help us out. Uh, click the subscribe button. We're getting close to a thousand, uh, which will make a big difference for us um and uh and helping us keep doing this and, and you know building more and more content uh and like the video it helps more people find um you know helps more people find this the more people that like it the more youtube will suggest it to other people so i always just got to get that out there i'm going to send out some stuff on social media but you know robbie fronts you know i'd love to see kind of what's your perspective on what are the basic fronts in canadian football yeah 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 for sure um can you see my screen so am i good to go yeah you're great you're great awesome yeah, so really quickly, I'll just um, – I'll talk to you guys today quickly about um, some basic defensive line, uh, front seven formations, and then we're going to build on top of that and just quickly talk about some different stunts and different things we can do and variations we can do on top of that to help get pressure into the backfield and help put our players in, in better situations to, to help get TFLs and to create some problems for, for offensive linemen. So just quickly talk about our itinerary. Um, First, we're going to talk about our gaps and our alignments and the different terminology that it's important. Everybody playing on D line or coaching D line needs to know. And then we're going to talk about our basic fronts, our most basic fronts that you'll need to know at every single level from high school to college to the pros to so the over and under. 
And then we're going to add some on top of that. And then we're going to talk about some fronts based on the location of the running back. And that's going to be our tread call and our jab call. And then quickly, we're going to talk about the jab and the rodent. And then on top of that, we're going to talk about really quickly, we're going to talk about a movement front and how that could help us in a different, in a couple of different situations. And then we'll talk about a uh, one, three, four front, which is a tight front, which is a, a great front that you could use um, playing the zone read. So, uh, so first, when we think about our gaps and our alignments, um, when we think about a gap, there are two ways that you can play defensive line. And one is in a gap system and the other would be in a man system. So in a gap system, every player would have a gap. And what a gap is, is basically a place or a gap is a space between two offensive players that a running back or a quarterback could run through. So as a defense, we want all of our gaps covered. So there's no where for the running back or for the quarterback to run. So if you could see on the right side or on the right picture here, um, we have our center and between our center on, and our guard on both sides, we have our A gaps. And so we have a weak side A gap and a strong side A gap. And then between our guard and our tackle, we have our B gaps on both sides. And then outside of our tackles, and if there's a tight end, um, there's our C gap. And then if you look one down, up into our heads up position. So you'll see the even numbers, which is the zero, the two, the four, and the six. So all of our zero numbers basically mean that we're head up alignment on um, the offensive player. So if we're in our zero technique, then we're head up on the center. If we're in our two technique, we're head up on the guard. If we're in our four technique, we're head up on the tackle. And you can see there's a six there. So if there's a tight end in the game, you say we're in a six technique, we'd be head up on the tight end. And if you look to that bottom row on that right side, you see the odd numbers. So the one, three, the five, and the seven. So if we're in our one technique, we're outside shade of the center. If we're in our three technique, we're outside shade of the guards on both sides. If we're in our five technique, we're outside shades of the tackle. And then our seven technique, if there was a tight end in the game, then we'd be our outside shade of that, of that tight end. And then we'll go back up to that second row if you could see it. So the zero, the two I, the four I, and the six I. So that's used when we want to be inside shade. So our two I would be our inside shade of our guards. And our four I would be our inside shades of our tackles. And six I would be inside shades of the tight ends. So I'll just say it one more time, our A gaps, B gaps, C gaps, those are the space between the guards and the tackles. Um, even numbers are heads up. Odd numbers are outside shade. Um, if it's um, an even number with an I in between it, that means we're inside shade of that same player. So the first thing we're going to talk about quickly is going to be our face, most basic overfront. So basically in our overfront, it's really simple, but in our overfront, our strength is going to be determined um, by where we are on the field. So in overfront, our strength is going to be to the field side. And what we do with the strength is our strength is going to be determined by where we want the tackles, um, the tackles and the linebackers to be placed. So in an over front, we want our three technique to the field side of the, fee, uh, the field, and we want our one technique to the boundary. With this, we have our mic in our strong side A gap, and we have our will in our weak side B gap. So what this allows us to do, if you think about it, um, We'll have a running back offside here. Let's think that um, our running back is running to a, the field right now in a field zone play. What this would cause, because we have this tackle and the strong side end in these two B gaps and C gaps, it would cause him to cut back into this A gap right here, into the soft A gap that the mic is playing. And then what we're going to have is we're going to have our end playing this post shimmy player. And then this end is going to be our cutback boot reverse player. And I'll show you guys a quick film of that just to show you guys what it looks like. And then we'll talk about. Can you see me? Hello? We got you, but we don't have your screen there. Oh, my screen stopped. That's all right. The other thing that's important here too is if you're watching, please feel free to throw a question in the chat. Um, as we do more of these lives, you know, we've, we've had some where we have a lot of questions. Um, this is a great, a great opportunity to get those questions answered. So if you have questions, please throw them in the chat. 
Um, I've got it open here and my eye on it. So we, we can we can get those answered for you as we go through it. You can see my screen uh, now? Yeah, you're perfect. All right, awesome, perfect. Okay, so we're talking about the overplay. So we're looking at the fields. So the field is on the left side and you can see we have that three technique to the field. We have our one technique to the boundary and then we have that will in that backside B gap. And then we have that Mac and we have that Mike and that strong side A gap. The two things that we're going to look for, especially as defensive ends, um, just talking about different technique is we have a pre-snap eye progression and we have a post-snap eye progression. So for our pre-snap eye progression, we want to look at a couple different things. So we want to think of three different things in our mind. And that's, we want to think of the box, the back and the line of scrimmage. So when I say that, when we're looking at the box, I mean anything in between and around the tackles in that area. So we're looking for anything dangerous or anything coming towards us. That's um, that could be a threat. So if you see on the left side, if you see number three, he's looking towards down the line. We need to be able to see that as defensive ends because he could be a low player or he could be a bomber player and he could come in and block us. So we need to be able to see that. The second thing is we need to be able to see is the back. So where the back is located. And that will tell us a lot as defensive linemen. So if we're on the same side as the back, that will tell us that we're the Sally side player. So that means we're on the side where if it's a zone replay, the quarterback will take the ball and potentially run it or throw it. And if we're away from the back, so offset the back, that would tell us that we're the zone player. So if there was a run play happening, then the run would happen to our side. So if you look at that, We'll just let this play, uh, play through, but you'll see every player has a gap in this situation. So we have our A gap accounted for. We have our strong side A gap. You see him playing that. We have our strong side B gap. We have our Mike number four playing that strong side A gap. We have our weak side A gap played by the, by the nose. And then we have the will and uh, the end playing that backside B gap, that B gap and that C gap. Pretty simple. Easy stuff. So same thing. You see number five shuffling down to play that cut. Same thing that you want to know. So we want to think of a post-snap eye progression. So in our post-snap eye progression, the first thing that we need to see is we need to see the hip of the tackle. So we need to see that hip of the tackle go down. And as soon as we see that hip go down, we need to have our eyes into the backfield and need to see any danger coming across us to make sure that we can play this cut player right there. And then once we see that, we could look at if, if we do see an exchange point for the quarterback, then we can look at the exchange point for the quarterback. But that's just a basic overfront. Those comments on the eye progression, that's, you know, when we talk about things that high school athletes can use that maybe your coaches don't have time, right? When you're thinking about a high school team, you know, you have priorities, safety, number one, you have to teach all the safe contact stuff. You have to teach all the basic fundamental, you know, alignment, assignment. What does that even mean? You know, it can, it can be tough. And I know this as a guy who coaches summer football with high school age guys, myself, when there's so much to learn, we often learn the same thing over and over because the coaches have to coach to relatively the, the group that knows the least, right? You just, cause one kid in your, you know, your grade 10 class can handle university calculus doesn't mean that, you know, the teacher can teach university calculus. So I think these are some of the things when you talk about pre and post snap eye progression, how much, whether it's U sport or NCAA or pro players are able to gather pre snap. It's just as easy, if not easier to do in high school, because teams will have more tells, right? Like, I think we all have that feeling of, Hey, if I went back to high school, it wouldn't even be the physical stuff that would help me now. It would be the mental side of it. You know, you talk about being on the Sally side or being on the zone side. If you guys take one thing from this conversation, like that's a great point right there to take away. Yeah, for sure. So just to say it one more time. So pre-snap eye progression, box, back, line of scrimmage, post-snap eye progression, hip of the tackle, down the line of scrimmage, and then the exchange point of the quarterback, especially if you're that Sally side player. And when I play these next clips, you're going to see the same principles over and over again. And I'm going to keep talking about it so you can see how, how relevant um, – those eye progressions are and how much they can help you. Um, so that was over, pretty simple. So now our next concept is under. So let's think again that um, our field is to the right side. So in an over, when we think um, our three tech was to the field, 
now in an under front, our three tech is going to be to the boundary side of the play. So with that, our nose tackle or our nose guard is going to be to the field side of the play. So literally they're just switching positions. So here you see the three tech is to the boundary and the one technique is to the field and an over, it's the opposite. The three technique is to the field, the nose is to the boundary. Um, what this does is this also changes the location of our will and our mic players right here. So nothing else changes for these two defensive ends, but just a quick thing. So you could see that this B gap right here, because it's played by this mic from depth, there's a little bubble and the guard will be able to get a little more dent and be able to climb up to the mic. So this isn't always a great situation if the zone is coming in this direction, but it is good for some other plays, like if we're running, um, or like if the other team runs a lot of power and stuff like that. But um, I'll show you guys um, something that we could do to, um, something that you could do to add on top of that to, to uh, provide a better look for that. But so those are our two, those are our over and our under front. I'm not gonna show you a clip for our under um, because it's very similar to our over. But right now we're gonna go to our front based off the back. So our first front based off the back is our tread front. And basically, um, instead of having your strength based off of the field, now that we know, especially that I talked about before, when there's a zone side and a sally side to each play, now we want to base what our defensive line is doing based on the location of the running back, because that's going to tell us a lot. So in a tread front, what we're going to have is we're going to have our three technique to the side of the back. So we want to have our three technique on the same side of the back, as you can see right here. Let me erase that. And then we're going to have our one technique on the side of, um, we're going to have our one technique away from the back. The ends are going to be in the exact same positions. Um, they're going to be the Sally player, or they're going to be the post and shimmy player. And the Mike and the Will, they're going to play this, um, this B gap and this A gap from depth. So one thing I talked about um, earlier is um, different penetrations and different exchanges that we could do as a defensive end to help create penetration and to help get ourselves in the backfield, especially on a first down. So one thing you could do, especially when we're away from the back in this tread call is we could do what's called a tread jab. And basically what that is, is instead of having our defensive end play the C gap and have this mic play this B gap from depth, what we're gonna do is instead we're gonna do a gap exchange. So our end is gonna jab inside into this B gap and create penetration and either get a T TFL or cause it cause the running back to bounce back. And our mic is gonna bounce around and play this A gap. And I'll just show you guys a great clip of that. So here's us running it against Montreal. And just as a quick pre-snap, you can see, so we're offset from the back on this left side right here. You can see number 56. He's going to be our jab player. Um, we have our one technique on, a, on away from the back. We have our three technique. He's going to play three technique on the same side of the back. So he's going to play that B gap. And then we have um, our linebacker that's going to wrap around and play that C gap. One more thing before I play this clip. Um, you see me on this backside, on the same side of the back. What we're doing right here is we have what's called a kill technique. And with this technique, instead of me being the shimmy player, because we're playing um, a very explosive quarterback that likes to do a lot of zone read, what we're going to do is we're going to run what's called a high-low concept. And basically on this high-low concept, I'm going to run up to the quarterback and I'm going to play the quarterback strong. So make sure that the quarterback can't play. And then 44 He's going to be the low player and he's going to play the running back. So I'll just let that play through. And you can see right here from the strong side. So you can see away from the back, the zone is coming towards this defensive end. He jabs inside of this B gap and then he forces the cutback from the running back. There's no other gaps open and he fills it back to our low player. That's a great so, shot there, Robbie. Who, who has the C-gap ultimately uh, if the ball bounces to the front side C-gap here? 
So for this play, I'm not ex exactly sure um, what this play is exactly, but most times when we played it, um, that Mike linebacker would be the scrape player. So he would be the one to scrape into that C gap. Gotcha. So he's got to almost play then because he shoots the the week A here. I'm just yeah, interested. Yeah, yeah. I, had, I love this for playing zone read, and I hadn't actually seen this. Um, so that Mike is almost two gap, and then he's going to play – like the dad, he, he'll play like he'll fit to the back essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the yeah. back's wide, he's wide. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. So, and just with the jab technique too. So, there are a couple different ways that you could play the jab technique. So, there's a couple. So, the first way you could play it is you could just spike into that B gap and rip under, or you could do what number 56 uh, Bishop does. And he actually puts hands on the tackle and then he rips underneath to get penetration in that gap. And then you could see everything else. So you could see that guard. He's playing that A gap. You see that weak side A gap getting played. You see that backside tackle. He's playing that B gap. And then we have me coming up to Vernon Adams here, playing the quarterback on that high concept. And then Ian Wild, he's a, that low player. And he's the one that ends up making the tackle. And again, you see how like basic understanding even builds here, right? Like you go from understanding, okay, what is the front? In high school, you know, you're usually playing one technique, right? Like you would either always be in shuffle or, or whatever. You always have the quarterback. Now you get, you know, up a level and you need more tools offensive or defensively, right? To handle the variety of, of offense that you see and the different skill sets and, and challenges formations put you in. And so if you, you know, if you're a young player watching this, I just hope you get an appreciation for, you know, exactly how much there is out there to learn. Like this is a, I've spent the last year trying to learn more concepts to handle, you know, defensively, like we were talking tight front before we got on, right. To like handle zone read. And I hadn't even, I hadn't even heard of this one yet. And I spent the last year on it. So, you know, it's uh, it's, this is great stuff. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So just moving on to that. So that was our trend call. Now we're going to move on to what's called our flip call. So our flip is going to be the opposite of tread, basically. So when we look back to our tread, we have our three technique on the same side as the back. Now in our flip call, we're going to have our three technique away from the running back. And then same thing. So our nose will be on the weak side A gap. And then now our, bite, our mic will be on that strong side A gap. And our will will be on that weak side B gap. So what this allows us to do is the same thing. If the running back is running zone away, or if, so if we're running offset the back and the running back is running zone away, what he's going to do is he's going to try and cut back into that strong side A gap. Um, and this is where a good rodent call would make perfect sense. And what we did, and I'll show you a couple of clips of that, is we ran another first down stunt in the run game to help us um, beat this run offset the back. So what we did here is instead we took our defensive tackle and in the three tech position, and we would jet him upfield to help create the cutback for the running back. So he would almost be the contained player. And then this would cause the, run back, the, the running back to cut into that strong side a gap. And then the end, he would be, have a rodent call or a text call, what we would call in a pass game, but he would run a text also in the run game. So he would take one step upfield and then he would wrap underneath the tackle into this a gap and make the play on the running back there. And then on the same backside, we would have whatever you want to do, whether it's a crash call or a kill call that we had, or this backside end would be the shimmy player, but he would be playing on the Sally side of the quarterback. So he would be the CBR player or what we call the cutback boot reverse player. Just another way of calling it. Um, just another way of saying your, that your responsibility is a Sally. Um, the mic would have this weak side uh, B gap and then the, or the will would have this weak side B gap and the mic would wrap around to the tackle. And I'll just show you guys two plays of that. Yeah, this is firing me up that you brought this up. I actually, uh, I actually wrote an article for Ron Mackey football. So uh, American website about, I had heard about this stunt and I had never really seen it played. I've been looking for examples of it as an interesting way to get to play six gaps with five guys. Yeah. And uh, I was particularly drawn to it because I thought, hey, in Canadian football, we're a yard off. 
like obviously part of what's challenging about this is actually running that rodent stunt correctly. Like, do you read with the defensive end? Like if, if it's not, if it's not pass, is he still, if it's not run, is he still running the text? Yeah. So that's um, the way we did it with our, it would just go into a, a, a longer text. So um, the defensive tackles are the three text job. His job would remain the same because he's trying to get a field as much as possible. And then if they ended up passing on first down, um, you would still just run the text um, just like you would normally. Yeah, but I've that seen, is a, uh, yeah, that is something that we had. I've seen some American teams where they will still run the text, but I've seen it where basically same idea, but you can get the will out of the box and the mic ends up playing like the backside B and then mm-hmm. your, your rush end is essentially playing like C to a gap. Um, mm-hmm. And, and if it does get outside of, of the end, then the overhang player has got to take it. But I've even seen teams where they'll run it and if they get stretched, the end will stay outside. Uh, and okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. They'll read it off the back or they'll read it off the tackle. Um, mm-hmm. So man, this is, uh, this is awesome stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just uh, quickly, I'll just um, explain it again. So right now you see we're offset of the back. So you see on the left side, um, that's going to be our zone side on the right side. That's going to be our Sally side. So more often than not, because we're on the Sally side, if you see this right defensive end number 75, he's going to be our cutback boot reverse player. So he's going to be that shuffle shimmy player, making sure the quarterback doesn't take it. And here, uh, number 93, Kwaku, he's going to be um, he's going to be our post shimmy player. But right now, this play, again, this is, would be the flip rodent. So right now you can see we're in a flip technique. So we have our three tech away from the back right here. We have our three tech away from the back. We have our one technique on the same side as the back. And then what's going to happen, number 90 is going to jet upfield. He's going to create contain to stop uh, number 23 called to cut back and number 93, this left defensive end, he's going to wrap it all the way around into this a gap. And we'll just look at that here. Great TFO celebrate, get up. Awesome. Little little love for the, uh, the Laurier partner in crime there. You love to see it. Yeah. I got to shut him out. Once I saw this play, I got to add it in there. But just a great way of just understanding what they're trying to do, um, understanding what an offense is trying to do in a typical zone play. This helps you a lot. Knowing where his cutback lanes are um, makes this rodent so successful, right? Um, Being able to cut back from that C gap to cut into that strong side A gap, knowing that that's where he's going to want to go. Perfect. And I'll just show you guys one more example of that. So this is uh, the Argos. We ran something similar against um, Montreal. And you can see the same thing is going to happen here. So we have our three technique away from the back. So we have that A gap open. Our mic is going to play our weak side A gap. And what's going to happen here is our three technique, he's almost going to do a swim move in the run game to get up field as much as possible to cause that running back to cut, to to cut back and number 54, our defensive end in this situation, he's going to put hands on the tackle and then he's going to wrap inside and run that rodent or run that tech stunt into that a gap, right? Where they're trying to run the zone. He gets a nice TFL. Oh, yeah, see, this is kind of what I liked it for. Like 27 can stay out of the fit, right? Because you essentially play like the end plays the C initially, which makes it impossible for the, the tackle to play the to play the three technique, right? So yeah. the three technique gets out of the field, well, the back's got to cut it back. So even though there's no one that ends up in the C, and I'm sure you could say your Sam linebacker, like overhang, you know, yeah. in, can play it or or zero could run over the top of it right and and you know hopefully make that play but uh th- this is the exact reason um i might have to dive deep into uh if you got a cut up of these i might have to dive deep into it because this is something that i find so intriguing you know and again we talked about like great stuff going on, on on this side of the border i think in canada we've been stressed more about finding ways to defend rpos like for years right yeah 
that, that you know, since since I was watching, you know, Anthony Calvillo throwing RPOs CFL <laughs> you know, 10, 15 years ago, right? Yeah. And you see these creative solutions, which yes, have you know, their some of their roots might be in the American game, but like the way that you fit it into, you know, a twelve man structure and deal with the the challenges you see, you know, in the Canadian game. This is awesome, you know, really high level stuff. And it all comes back to you understanding fronts. Like there's both your alignment and then there's like your implied role within the, within the front, right? Like if you're, you know, if you're playing the three technique, right, you're playing with a totally different set of leverages than if you're the one technique. So I think where a lot of guys like stop learning, you know, at the, okay, I line up in the B gap, I have the B gap. Well, yeah, in a fundamental football world, sure. But like, this is what you're going to have to know, like later, you know what I mean? And, and building on that, I think it's huge. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, and then now we'll go on to our movement front. So our movement front, it's called a couple different things. Um, we'll call it two, two. Um, but basically, so our first two fronts are over and are under. Those are based on the strength of the field. And those are our basic, basic fronts. Um, our other two fronts, so our tread and our flip, those are based on the location of the back. Um, now our 2-2 two, two front or our 22 front, however you want to call it, this will actually be based on the movement of the offensive line. So basically our ends are going to have pretty similar, almost the same jobs. Um, our defensive tackles, they're both going to be lined up in the two gaps. And basically what they're going to do is they are going to run and they're going to op occupy the gap opposite of the flow. So on the back side of the flow, our defensive tackles are going to backdoor the play. Our mic and our will are going to be stacked on top of them, and they're going to be on the front side of the flow. And there are a couple different ways to coach this, but um, one way that you can coach it is you could actually use the nose and the tackle to play on the back side of the flow and to hold up the guards and really prevent them from getting upfield and climbing towards the mic and the will. So they're able to play that backside, whatever backside gap they're at, and allow the mic and the will to get penetration and to get up to the line of scrimmage without um, that combo block being successful on them. So I'll just show you guys an example. So let's say we're flowing to the right with our tackle, our guard, and then our guard is going to try and climb up to our mic. What? Um, so what our tackle and our nose if we're flowing to the right, they're going to be on the back side of this flow. So our tackle would be in, a, in that strong side A gap, and that nose would be in that back side B gap. And then our mic and our will, they would flow over the top of this flow. And hey, I'll Ronnie, just show you guys. A good question. Uh, how, so talking about the fronts that are based on the back, how yeah. do you go about, and I'm sure there's more than one way to do this in game plan and stuff, but if you get a team that spends most of their time in pistol, like that's yeah. one of the big things that I've noticed again, like a, there's a lot of cool stuff going on south of the border. Originally, I, you know, that that's where I saw it first and I started to recognize it in like older CFL film that I was watching, you know what I mean? About the location of the back. And I think it's so hard in Canada because they can motion late. Yeah. Right. And so how do you guys handle that? Like if this is a big part of your game plan, how do you handle, you know, even if they don't stay in pistol all the way to the end, but just how late they can motion out of the pistol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with pistol, that's something. So we do, or we'd have a lot of fronts that would just be based on flow. So just if I could show you, I need to erase all this stuff. But let's say we're in pistol. Um, what you could do as a defensive end or as a coach, what we do is we'd have um, a jab crash call. So basically, if they were in pistol, whatever side um, the flow was towards um, would determine your um, job as a defensive end. So let's say they ran a flow away from you. That means you would be, or if they ran a flow towards you, so to this side, uh, let me change it back to black. If they ran flow towards you, you would be the jab player. But if they ran a flow away from you, then you'd be the crash player and you would crash down on the running back and the mic would wrap around. The same thing we ran in a couple of days, especially with the, um, with the text fronts. Um, what we would do is if the flow was towards you and you had the three technique on your side, you would be the, the text player. And if the flow was towards you and you were on the open gap side here, you would be the jab player. 
So um, it's a, a little more thinking for you to do as a defensive end. But, you know, regardless, if you have flow towards you, um, you're going to make a quick decision on, on, on what's happening. If, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it is tough. It's a great question. I said it's a great question in the chat because, you know, so much of this stuff, like I've seen American defenses where it's like all based on the back. And I go, wow, like in Canada, you could bounce the back. He could be strong, weak, anyway. then strong again. Like it's so hard to like nail down those tendencies. But again, I think especially at the youth level, you know, you might get teams that just never leave the pistol. But, um, you know, especially if in pass protection or whatever, you know, you're going to get that guy walk up at some point. Yeah, 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 for sure. Uh, I'll just show you guys a couple of clips that we have of that 22. Uh, I'll show you the first clip against BC. I think that shows a pretty good look of, of what you could accomplish with it. So you can see just before the play starts, um, you know, you're able to see both these defensive tackles, their head up, so they're in both of those two gaps. And then we have our linebackers stacked on top of them. It's going to be flow to the right. So they're going to flow to the back sides of the gaps. Um, so the same thing when I talked about that pre-snap eye progression, when we talk about box back line of scrimmage, this would tell you when you see number 20, uh, big Mario Villamazar and number 16 running around the box that you know pre-snap, you need to be able to see that. You need to be able to see there's something going on. And, and whether they're the load player or whether they come to bomber you, um, you need to have your eyes away from, uh, you need to have your eyes aware from that. But just to show you guys back to the defensive tackles. So if you see number 90 on this weak side, he is going to fill into this backside B gap. And what he's going to do is he's going to hold up number 67 while playing that backside B gap. And he's going to let a free release for number 44 to come in and make a play on that ball almost untouched. Same thing here. Um, we have a defensive tackle here, number 23. <clears throat> He's going to play that strong side A gap and he's going to hold it up. He's going to stop 68 from really being able to come off early and, and, and climb up to that, uh, to that linebacker. So you can see our defensive tackles, they're playing on the back side of that flow and they're holding up the guards and they're not allowing um, those guards to climb up to the linebackers. And you can see number 44, he's able to ultimately come in and help make the tackle. Same so thing's happening from talk about sorry. those guys going opposite the flow. You know, I know you already talked kind of about eye progression, but is there anything specific? You know, how do you, you know, obviously we talk all, a lot, defensive coaches, about like fighting pressure. You know, how would you coach a young defensive tackle? Like, if this was the first time you're being exposed to this, like, where do your eyes have to be? Where do your hands have to be to, to play that technique? Yeah, so uh, especially as coaches and the way we were coached, um, we were almost told, um, or at least in 22, when you're going to be on the back side of the flow, you almost be going to be a half second late to the party. So you're going you're gonna to want to feel the flow out first. So you're going to feel where the flow is. And you're, because you're playing on the back side of the flow anyway, you're going to be a second late to wherever the flow is going. And then the way we coach it, because we want to hold up the guards, so there are two ways to coach it. There's one way to coach it where the defensive tackles could come in and get underneath and try and get penetration. And the other way is for the linebackers to come in and make the plays. So when we want the linebackers to come in and, and be aggressive and make those plays for the defensive tackles, we want to play through the guard. So we want to get our hands on the guard and play through the guard to make that play. So if you could see uh, this right side guard here, um, he's getting his hands on the guard. And then he's still playing in that A gap, but you can see his hands are on the guard and the guard has to come off late to go and um, get to that, uh, get to that will. And he's able to come off and still make the tackle. He's able to split that double team. And then the same thing when I talk about um, post-snap progression, so it goes from the hip of the tackle, especially on this backside defensive end, hip of the tackle, and then he sees that bomber in, and then we got to cut that. Make sure you make a miss. But yeah, it's a good tackle. Okay. One more play there. 
Can you hear me? Hello? Sorry, I was muted there. Yeah, we, we, oh, got, okay, okay, okay. we got your screen up there fine. I just wanted to make sure that the last time it cut out, so I wanted to make sure. No, you're good. But um, so here's another example of that 22 call. So right now we have a little variation on top of it. So right here we have what's called a 22 jab. So if you see the back is right behind this goalpost. So number 56, uh, Bishop here, you can see that he's offset of the back. So he knows that flow is probably going to come towards him. So what he could do with that and what he's going to do is he's going to jab underneath inside that B gap. And number 45, um, Herdman, he's going to wrap around to that C gap. And then everything else still applies. So the defensive tackles are going to be a half second late and they're going to play on the backside of that flow. And they're going to be the ones that um, play on the backside of the flow. And then the linebacker, number 51, he's going to flow on top of it. Sorry, when you work that jab technique, uh, seeing it here from the defensive end, what's yeah. the what are the coaching points in terms of like the footwork and – you know, do guys have some, some, you know, freedom to, like I see here, it's just a big inside rip. Um, yeah. You know, this is another like technique that I've been trying to learn more about, you know, to, again, a lot of the stuff that I've been trying to learn about recently has been defending, uh, defending spread offense by playing six gaps with five guys. And, and this is one way to do it, you know, ripping inside and letting your linebacker, you know, your overhang play the C gap. Um, do you usually, would you want the, the defensive end to get hands on the tackle first or because he already knows, cause he's opposite the back, it almost becomes like a stunt for him. Like he's not reading it out. He knows he's running the jab. Yeah. So he does know he's running the jab because he's offensive, um, opposite of the back, but we were giving a couple, we were given a couple of different ways and, 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 and a bunch of freedom in ways that we could play this technique. So if you saw the, I believe it was the tread jab, um, I'll just show it again one more time. When he played it, he put hands on the tackle and then he jabbed underneath. And then here he ripped totally underneath. So we were given a progression. So the first thing that you could do is you could just spike inside of the B gap and just take, so from your alignment, just take a steps, all your steps downhill straight into the B gap. And then the second way, what he's doing here is we were taught that we could take a hard step upfield so you can see he takes one step upfield to fake it, and then he's able to rip into that B gap. And then the third technique is that you could put hands on the tackle, um, give him a punch, and then fall underneath into that B gap. So it's just, especially as the game goes on, if you're going to run this jab concept a couple times, you want to give the offensive tackle a couple different looks because you, you want to keep him guessing, right? Absolutely. And then same thing for this 22 front. So – same thing. They're playing on the backside of the flow. If you see number 90 on the backside, he's really getting hands on this guard too and really stopping this guard from climbing up to get to that Mike linebacker. So same thing. He's a half second late, late to the party. And then he's playing through the guard to help get him in. And then the same thing that we talked about when you're on the, when you're on the Sally side of the quarterback, looking at number zero, Toby Antigua, and how he plays this and how he's able to fall in and make the tackle. When we talk about that same eye progression, the post, the pre-snap eye progression would tell us that there's something coming here, right? That there's something coming towards us. But even our post-snap eye progression, you can see that he sees the hip of the tackle go down. And then he's looking into that backfield to see if there's any cutters coming towards him. He sees the cutter and he's able to work off of it with block, with off of that block. And then he's able to come under and make that tackle. Great job. Fantastic job. And those will be our 22 fronts based on the movement. Our last front that we're going to talk about here, um, not something that the Argos have ran um, a, to a whole bunch, but it's something that I've been seeing a whole bunch on film. And even looking at three downs videos and seeing the amazing bre breakdown you did of the tight front, it's something I've been looking at. And that's something I think is, is a great job that um, defenses can put in their playbook to help stop against the, the, the zone read. 
um, especially when you're playing the zone lock and talking about um, our Mike and our Will being confident players and, and getting them out of positions. Um, so in the tight front, basically what we're going to have is we're going to have our two defensive ends. And instead of our defensive ends playing the C gap, our defensive ends are going to play both B gaps. And they're going to play it from the four eye position. So they're going to be lined up in a four eye and they're going to play our B gaps and they're going to occupy the Gardner tackle. Um, we have both of our linebackers. They're going to be our conflict players and they're going to be playing the C gaps from depth. So that brings them a lot closer to their past responsibilities. And they could also play the C gap. Uh, you might have drawn an extra person in the box, but we're going to have a mic in the box. And he is going to play off of uh, the nose and the nose is going to two gap um, on the center. And I'll just show you guys a great play of what that looks like. This is Calgary running it against Montreal. So just before the play, we can see um, stand back number 30 to 31. He's on the right side. So we know our zone is going to be out to the left. And we know number 41 on this right side, that linebacker, he's going to be on the Sally side. So we see our two defensive ends. They're playing their position from the four eye. They're going to play the B gap. And then we have our nose right here. You see he's head up on the center. He's going to two gap it. And that's going to, that's going to let a free release for the mic. And that's going to allow him to play from depth and just allow him to go untouched into that strong side A gap and make a great tackle. So same thing. You can see both of our four eye players. They're playing those B gaps. Great push on that one technique on the center. Our nose or our mic, sorry, is able to go untouched and he's able to make that tackle against his own. It's just so hard, like schematically as an offensive lineman, when, when you look at this and obviously, you know, there's answers for everything in football, nothing's unbeatable. But when you look at playbooks that are built on zone, right? Inside zone, outside zone, um, and just what is hard for offensive linemen to do. In general, I would say most offensive linemen would agree with a couple things. Number one, we want to know who we're going to block pre-snap. Number two, we want to either have help or leverage, right? We either want help between us and the football, or we already want to be in that leverage position. And just the ability for those four eyes to essentially almost like those two defensive tackles did in, in the two-two front to really make it hard for the guard or the tackle to get to the second level. And the thing I love about it is like, even if you look at this backside guard, like you look at the backside guard here, 50 have to chip back in on yeah. that four eye. Now you're never going to, now you're, you know, your nose, your mic's going to make the play every time. Right. Yeah. If 50 stays in on that, then that backside four eye, you know, I think it's 64 is the offensive tackle is doing a pretty good job there, but you know, he doesn't have leverage or help. You're taking away your alignment creates the leverage you want on defense and, you know, the structure of the defense being, you know, of this front being such that, you know, the mic is able to play off the center, you know, and it's so hard to get to, to that middle linebacker player. You know, if, if you see teams that run a lot of zone, like this is, this is something that two years ago I saw for the first time. And I was saying to you before, I was like, that's a problem. Like, yeah, all those offensive guys that want to be able to run, you know, inside zone with 13 different tags and RPOs and the load and the slice and the bomber and all that stuff, you know, yes, you can do some things to attack the edges in this defense, but usually like your outside linebackers, a lot of times are like your best players, right? Like it's, those guys are, you know, you're funneling the football into those positions and letting those, getting those guys out of conflict. Like you mentioned, you know, it's just such a challenge. You're able to essentially play like spread defense with a 50 front really yeah, with, with 50 front run fits. Yeah, but um, that's pretty much all I have for today. Um, just those plays. Uh, so the over, the under, the flip, and the text. Um, I think, obviously, um, most of the time, especially if you're a, whatever you are, a defense coordinator or or, um, or if you're a defensive end or a young defensive tackle, most of the time they're going to be in these base formations. But I think these jabs and these gap exchanges like the rodent and the rat call are great change-ups that you could do to help get pressure and help get penetration, especially on first down when we're talking about in the run game, especially when you know it's zone and stuff like that. But that's um, those are the major, major things that I had to talk about today.
Yeah, that's that's awesome. There's a great question in the chat, and I'm I'm going to assume it's specifically about the tight front. Um, in your so the question is, how can you support the conflict players being the Sam and Will with contain if you're dealing with a mobile quarterback? So like thinking tight front, right? How can you contain the quarterback? I'm interested to hear your your take on that because there's like a few schools of thought, and I actually have a funny story about the one. Um, that I've been able to learn. Like, that was my first question when I looked at this defense. I was like, okay, this is a – like, if this is inside run, this is the last thing I ever want to see. But how does this actually work, like, in-game over 100 snaps with, you know, mobile quarterbacks and stuff like that? So if you were a, a – a, this sounds like more a coach question than a player question, but, you know, how are you trying to contain people in the pass rush out of the tight front, I guess, is the question. That's a great question. Um, but I know Calgary ran it a couple times. Um, I'm actually not sure, but I believe they ran stunts where they actually had the four eye and the four eye players actually wrapped around to play the contain. And they actually, um, obviously it's not amazing in terms of pass rush and, and getting out there in the pass rush, but in able to maintain the pocket and keep contain, um, having the four eyes come out and, um, and being able to play that would be would be very helpful. The only other thing I could think of would be another type of exchange. Um, and that would have to be either between the mic and a four eye player. So um, either a gap exchange there and either a gap exchange there or, or something of that nature, right? Yeah. I other mean, than that, I'm, yeah. What, what I've seen is most teams that are running this, there's a couple of things. Uh, I've been waiting on doing a video, which I'll probably do in the next month, specifically again on the tight front, kind of what I've learned in the last year on the tight front from when we put that last video out. There's a couple of schools of thought. So number one, usually you're going to like, you're going to have a fourth rusher, right? So yeah. if we're doing, no one's really running this and purely dropping eight. Um, so your fourth rusher, if it's an outside linebacker, you know, your four eye to the other side has to become the contained player. Now, the interesting thing is with protections, like it depends on what protection you're getting. But for the most part, when teams see this front, they have some tough choices to make in protection. Like if you pause it pre-snap, you know, are you going to fan your tackles to the outside linebackers and put the running back one-on-one -on, -one on the mic? Or are you going to put, say, the running back on number 41 here and slide the protection to the field? If you're getting the, the fan protection where the tackles are setting out, then you're kind of like when you talked about like the three tech getting up the field and the tech stunt, like you can almost contain from the B gap. Yeah. Um, and if you're not getting that, then, you know, whichever linebackers to the side of the back, blitz him, get one-on-one -on -one with the running back, you're only bringing four and you're playing all your base coverages, Right. The interesting thing, and I've seen this be really common, like whether it's U.S. high school or, and I have to watch more CFL specifically looking for the tight front to see, you know, what teams are doing this in the CFL. But like the middle linebacker, again, because you only have three, if, unless you're dropping nine, if you're going to do your traditional pass distribution with a fourth rusher, they'll, yeah. they'll put their best athlete at Mike, or, and usually that often happens, right? One of your best high school players is going to be your middle linebacker. And they'll say, hey, you don't have a pass responsibility. You have the quarterback out either edge. Mm -hmm. So you basically tell those three interior D linemen, like, you guys do what you got to do to try and disrupt the pocket. It's three on five. We know that that's not great numbers in, in, the, in the pass rush game. If you got to go inside, go inside. If you got to go outside, go outside. If you got to, you know, do whatever you need to do. Or they'll stunt those three, like you said. So they'll run some kind of three man stunt and they'll just say, Hey, middle linebacker, like you got the quarterback out both ways. Mm -hmm. um, which is, I saw that and I was like, okay, especially on the big Canadian field, like that could be a big problem. And I, yes, I, and it gets outside a quarterback. There's some validity to that, but I've also just seen enough reps where the, if you like, I think if you're running this defense, you need to have a plan for how you're going to get pressure. And that like anything comes in escalations. You know, so for me, and, and this is getting into something maybe I'll do more, in more detail um, in another video, but to me, your escalation number one is, okay, can I get a little bit of pressure with three plus the mic? And you can really scheme the protection and like tell the guys, hey, like if we get fan protection, we've got the four eyes one-on-one -on, -one on the guards. Like we should be able to win one of those matchups. Yeah. Um, and if we're not getting fan protection, then then that's where okay are we going to blitz to the side of the back so for example 41 becomes the pressure player 
Uh, mm-hmm. And then the mic drops and replaces him in the coverage or however you want to do it. Um, and then almost every team that runs this runs like fire zone pressure. So they'll, okay, if they want to get pressure, well, we'll bring say 41 and a half back to that side, right? And, mm-hmm. and slant the D line away and create the five tech. The other thing I've seen people do is take the four eye away from the back. Still like they would basically play a jab, but then widen yeah. them out to a five technique so that you get one edge rusher. Um, and then, you know, for the mic, who again becomes the fourth rusher, Hey, like you just have to spy the one side mostly because you have a five tech the other way. Um, mm-hmm. That, that is one of the better questions uh, that we've gotten here in a while. Um, when offensive base at a pistol, uh, I have been successful with the double tech stunt at the high school level. Um, that that's more of a statement there for sure. But yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that was one of the interesting things I stumbled on this year. And I, and I didn't even know you were going to talk about that, Robbie, that fired me up. Um, have you guys ever run that like to both sides where if you get a team that's going to stay in pistol, you know, both sides are going to run, like, I guess it would be out of a wide front. You'd have to have like two, two, uh, two. Yeah, we ran a, we ran a, oh, I wish I had, I wish I saved the plays, but we ran a whole, we ran a whole bunch of it. We were like in a whole bunch of different ways. We would have, um, we have a couple different calls, but just based on the flow, um, we'd always have a player to the side of the flow or on the side of the flow, we'd always have a defensive end doing some sort of stunt, um, whether it was in a pistol or not, because a lot of teams, especially like, it's a pretty easy read. Like once you know that they're, um, once you know, we're keying off the back, um, they would, they would come out of their pistol or they would come out of their pistol or play with their pistol really late. But um, maybe I could send you some clips after. Yeah, sure. No, Hey, this is fantastic, Robbie. Thanks so much for, for putting this together. My other PSA for people who are worried about pistol is if you get a team that's going to stay in pistol, you got to find ways to pressure more, right? Like just make the back get out of pistol. Um, You know, like as a running back coach myself, like we would always encourage our guys be in pistol as as long as you can. But then if you're playing, you know, Scott Brady at Mac or someone with a great pressure package, I'm telling, you know, I'm telling my back, Hey, like we got to protect first. Like I love the, I love the um, I love the element of, of staying pistol as long as we can. So if you you will get teams, that, especially in the run game, that stay in the pistol, but then it can become a great tell, right? Where hey, if the ball snapped and they're still in pistol, it's a run play. Yeah, um, you know that that can definitely be a great tell there. So hey, you know that that's amazing, Robbie. Thanks so much. The, the clinic there, everything was put together is awesome, and um, that's the last question we had there in the chat. So. Uh, if you haven't yet and you're watching, please like the video. It helps more people find it. Uh, hit subscribe. We're pushing. I think we need another 113 subscribers to get to that, uh, to get to that thousand mark. We've been working for over a year at now. So the other thing you can do if you want to help us out is, is just share our stuff, you know, with your players or, or, you know, with your buddies, if you're a player that's watching. Um, so we can keep getting more great Canadian, uh, Canadian content out there, but um, I'm going to take us off to the live stream now. Again, huge thanks to Robbie Smith. That was a super detailed, uh, detailed presentation. And, you know, I can't wait to go back and watch, you know, some of that again and, and cut some of that up for our social media stuff. But thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. And, and looking forward to seeing, you know, some Argos highlights of some of that run stuff this, uh, this year with you in it. So thanks a lot, man. There you go. Yeah, for sure.